homes, businesses and farms destroyed. The fires are burning out of control well, across the country. Monsoonal rains have swamped. Second record-breaking flood in just... More catastrophic days. Three red haze set to break another heat record tomorrow. Climate change is in the news and our weather, or more accurately, recent extreme weather events are being linked to the biggest environmental issue facing our planet today, global warming. And not just here in Australia, but all over the world. There are lots of examples of extreme weather events from just the past couple of years and in many parts of the globe. What causes these extreme weather events is the subject of debate. It's not a simple cause and effect relationship, but virtually all Earth scientists and climatologists agree that changes in weather patterns are related to increased concentrations of greenhouse gases. So what are greenhouse gases? And exactly what are they doing to our atmosphere? There are lots of different greenhouse gases. Some like carbon dioxide, methane and water vapour are well known. Others exist in much smaller quantities, but by volume, they're much more damaging to the environment. What all these gases have in common is the ability to trap heat. After radiation from the sun heats the Earth, the warm surface emits heat radiation. The greenhouse gases slow the escape of this heat radiation back into space, trapping it inside a sort of invisible glass ceiling and causing temperatures underneath to rise. This process is called the greenhouse effect. It's like what's happening inside this car. Heat from the sun is being absorbed by the car's interior, which in turn heats the air in the car. Now, with the windows up, that heat is trapped inside. And in the same way, greenhouse gases trap that heat from the sun around our planet. And it doesn't take much to shift the balance. 20 degrees out here, and 36 inside. A difference of that magnitude to the Earth's average temperatures would be truly catastrophic. The greenhouse effect is not necessarily a bad thing. It's the reason temperatures on Earth are generally so mild compared to the freezing temperatures on the Moon, which has no atmosphere. And life on Earth has evolved quite specifically to live in these temperate conditions. But over the past 200 years, greenhouse gas production has increased significantly, and the result is global warming, which is leading to climate change. So what created these changes that have led to all this erratic weather and the serious consequences that follow? Well, the first thing to say is it didn't happen overnight. Industrialisation began back in the mid-18th century, and by the end of the 19th century, our dependence on fossil fuels really took off. We use them for producing electricity, like this coal-fired power station used to generate electricity for Victoria, but also in transport. Ships, planes, cars, buses, trucks, they all burn fossil fuels in the form of petrol, gas and diesel. And unfortunately, burning fossil fuels produces that well-known greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide. Increasing populations have meant increasing food production, which results in more methane gas released into the atmosphere from agriculture and the dumping of organic wastes. More people, more cars, increased demand for consumer goods, transport, food, the whole of humankind is contributing to the production of greenhouse gases. Humans are heating up the planet. So who's doing something about it? It's a fact that scientists were the first to blow the whistle on this looming environmental disaster. And most governments and big business didn't want to hear what they had to say. Today, many of the world's leading scientists are working towards finding solutions to the Earth's big challenges. I'm here to meet Dr David Etheridge, a world authority on, of all things, ice. Well, more accurately, the gases that remain trapped in that ice for thousands of years because they contain an amazing story. Scientists like Dr David Etheridge play a really important part in the quest to better understand climate change. Through research, which may take years to collate and interpret, we start to see a picture of what's happening. We collect proof 
And believe it or not, these ice cores provide startling evidence that the Earth's atmosphere is changing, and fast. The main thing that we're looking at in the ice cores is what the atmosphere has been made of in the past. And the only way we know that we can do that is to go into polar ice. Now that ice is quite special because it falls as snow and as it gets more and more buried and compressed, eventually you get air locked off into bubbles. And it's that air that we're analysing in this laboratory. Now the oldest ice core that's analysed is around about 800,000 years, pretty close to a million years. The focus that we have here in this lab is to look at the past several thousand. So we're not going quite so far back in time, but we're looking at the more recent period in much finer detail. Let's look at this one. The three greenhouse gases. Over the last 2,000 years, carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. So if we look at the modern day, we're obviously at higher concentrations for all of those gases than we have been for 2,000 years. We also see that before the gases increased a couple of hundred years ago, it's been pretty steady in concentration for several thousand years. There are scientists involved in lots of fascinating work, travelling to every imaginable place on Earth, researching and refining the models that forecast climate change, flying high and diving deep into the oceans to better understand the complex interactions between all living things and the planet we call home. Scientists are also central to the challenge of predicting outcomes. What will happen if we ignore the data and fail to reduce our carbon emissions significantly? I'm here to meet Professor Amanda Lynch, who has been researching the social and economic consequences of climate change. So in a nutshell, what are some of the short-term impacts we're likely to see in Australia from climate change? We're likely to see environmental distress first, uh, water quantity and quality issues, heat wave. Those will flow on to economic impacts. It's pressure on cities, health systems, and it's pressure on the very social fabric uh, that we've built up. So climate change is not just an issue for Australia, of course. It's really a global issue. Oh, there's no doubt that in the longer term, as sea levels rise, they're rising already, countries that have large populations on the coast are going to start to see the effects of that sea level rise, particularly during storms. A case in point is Bangladesh, which has very large populations in very low-lying areas. And those people have nowhere to go. They will become environmental migrants. And as time goes on and the problems become more acute, uh, we'll start to see environmental refugees. And do, do you think war is part of that scenario? One could argue that we've already seen wars uh, associated with climate problems, uh, particularly in Africa. And so it's, it's certainly not unreasonable to assume that uh, if we do nothing, that war isn't just a possible outcome, it's a likely outcome. We have the tools at our disposal to avoid this future, but we need to act right away. Scientists alerted the world to the issue of climate change. They've had an important role explaining and defining the problem, and of course they're a big part of the solution too. So what's being done to turn things around? Well, one of the big growth areas is the quest to find alternatives to fossil fuels for the production of electricity. These are technologies such as solar energy, wind power, hydro, wave and tide technologies, and geothermal technology that uses heat from underground. It also includes more controversial energy industries like clean coal technology and nuclear energy. And of course the race is on to find alternatives to fossil fuels for transport. These include hydrogen, biodiesel and bioethanol and more recently the use of electricity itself to power our cars. Each solution is complex and may have adverse effects. For example, growing crops for biodiesel uses land that would otherwise be used to grow food. And then there's the future yet to be invented technologies that are fermenting in the minds of our next generation. Clearly we have a future full of challenges. 
And with those challenges come important and exciting opportunities. Our next generation of school leavers will need to ask themselves that question. Do you want to be part of making a difference? If you do, perhaps the sciences are where you're heading.